Hey everybody, it's Mike again. I wanted to speak uh, today about a subject I've been hearing more and more about, uh, this um, targeted individuals, gang stalking. I know from personal experience that there is such a thing. Um, my story <clears throat> is a little different. I guess everybody's stories uh, are different about what it means and what it feels like to be targeted. Um, my experience has been uh, the first one I, I, I had really that I can recall was when I was in college in Pittsburgh. I went to an art uh, institute there and I had a job about eight or ten miles uh, uh, east of Pittsburgh uh, May, uh, chopping picture frame molding to size and building picture frames and that sort of thing. I did that for a while uh, after I got out of the service. And so it was easy to get a job with those with those folks because they were suppliers to the frame shop uh, in which I worked uh, in those days. And uh, <clears throat> I thought this was really great. I mean, I, I don't have to learn anything new. I mean, I, I I'm basically doing the same job I'd always been doing, and uh, the, the pay was decent enough. I was able to live off of it fine and pay for my schooling and so on. And uh, I quickly learned, little by little, over the course of the days and weeks and months, I was there for about two years, that I was a target and I didn't know why I was the kind of person that if I go to work do my job uh, make as few mistakes as I possibly could and the last people I wanted to make angry with me were you know the, the people in charge my bosses they were uh, they were brothers and so it just kept going on and it got worse and there were different ways in which they made my life there difficult. It was subversive and uh, became more overt as the time, as my time there went on. Um, it wasn't until a person there, uh, a person who shall remain nameless, and I promised this person that I would never reveal their identity, ever, and I will not hear. This person told me that the reason why I was targeted by two individuals there uh, who worked in a department uh, where I was, uh, one was a fellow uh, frame chopper that's what we call ourselves we you know that's the that's the name of the machine it was called a chopper it was a guillotine device that cut uh, picture frame molding and another fellow who was much older he was about 55 at the time this other fellow was like 30 31 34 or something <clears throat> this has been 25 years ago uh, this year will be 25 years this fall and uh they both were in on it together. They didn't seem to be real pals in any way, other than, you know, as far as people go, you know how you can tell people get along with each other and so on. These two guys really didn't seem to get along well or in any other special way than just a couple of guys that work in the same place. Um, but this person, whom I'm speaking, to whom I'm, of whom I'm speaking, uh, told me that there was a fellow that had my position. I took his place, this fellow. He was very well liked by these two other guys. And this fellow that they liked was fired by the two brothers. And because he was fired, and the reasons... Uh, through which he was fired. I mean, he did something. He just started just doing something, stuff that just wasn't, I don't know. It was such an easy job. I, I can't imagine what it would take to get yourself fired. It, it, 
I just never understood really. I, I used to know the reason. <clears throat> anyway, the cell got fired, and then two guys that were mean to me uh, eventually, when this guy got fired, they said, they told the, the bosses, they said, whoever you hire, we don't care who it is, we're going to treat that person badly because we don't like what you did to this guy, the guy we liked. You fired him, and whoever else you get, we're going to treat him like garbage. And that's what they did. And I was the guy. So, it was a direct targeting. It wasn't through uh, surveillance. It wasn't through any other type of means other than just being mean to me when I was there in person. Uh, I have heard the stories of others. Uh, I've spoken online with other people who have been targeted and they say it's a lousy existence. I want to talk about what it is, this business of the behind the scenes, what it is, okay? My perceptions of it because I was a targeted individual and that sort of thing. There are people in this world who have no compassion. My wife likes to say that they were born without something. They were, and I used to argue with her over that, not fight. I'm just saying it was a disagreement I, because I couldn't understand how it was that anyone could be born without, you know, the stuff that you need to live a real life in this world. Until I discovered the real meaning of the wheat and the chaff. There's some people in this world who simply are not going to see heaven. They're just not. And those people are going to be the chaff, the weeds. Uh, scriptures talk about uh, somebody coming in in the night and they plant weeds among all the wheat. And then the next day the workers go out in the field and they tell the owner of the field, oh, we've got some subterfuge going on here. What should we do? Should we rip out the weeds? And the owner of the field said, no, we'll let them grow together. And then when the time comes, we'll take them all up at the same time and separate them. That's what's going to happen. Those are the people who are targeting us. Those are the people who walk around seemingly just dumb to the fact that they are being Satan's puppets, Satan's robots, okay? They are. They do it directly, and they do it indirectly. So each of us has their own experiences with people doing it directly. So how do they do it indirectly? They do it this way. They, they become dumbed, okay, dumbed down. Um, you've seen these fugitives and whatever, they catch them uh, on television, and they're just... They look like they're so stupid. They really do. It, they, it's like they have an, an, an ounce of intelligence anywhere. Um, they're just adult. They're just... I can't think of the word that I normally use at the, at the moment. But th they really are just something else. They just go through their life being stupid. These are the perfect puppets. There are others who are not stupid. You know, you won't see them on a, a television show, The Fugitive Files, or anything you see on your local news. These are people who are going about their everyday lives the same way, the same day, all the time. I knew a guy one time, he was a vacuum cleaner salesman. He was a very good vacuum cleaner salesman. And he says, talking about another guy in the office with whom he worked, he said, this guy never learns a thing. He lives the same day over and over and over again. He never learns anything. He never understands that when people say a certain thing, that means they're not going to buy the vacuum cleaners. Or if they say this, it really means something else. He doesn't, he couldn't, for some reason, bring himself to the understanding of what it took to be, to be a good salesman. And he was always amazed when people didn't call him back. And he was always amazed when people weren't at home when they said they would be. This guy, this guy I knew tried to tell him, he said, we never learned. So we've got people like that. <clears throat> they go about just being, they may not be stupid, they may be intelligent, but they do stupid things. And they do stupid things because either that's the way they've been taught or, you know, they just weren't born with something. 
simple empathy. I'm going to discuss driving. Okay, because driving is a, being on the road is a, a perfect analogy to all of this. Think of a road and what do you have? You have one way to get here or there. Let's, let's not talk about a highway per se. Let's talk about a, a, a state road like the one not far from me. It's the direct way into town. It's the direct way home. When I leave the house to go anywhere, usually, and I, when I say usually, I'm talking about 99.999% of the time, I can get into town without any trouble. Nobody really does anything stupid doing 30 miles an hour in the 55 zone or and stuff like that. But on the way home, it's like that every single time. I can count on one hand the amount of times that I've come back home within in the last six months where I didn't have some doofus, some jack leg on a bright sunny day that just will not go any faster than 35, 40 miles an hour in a, in a 55 mile an hour zone. They just won't do it. I like to say, you know, I try to talk myself you know, to be calm. And I said, listen, Mike, it's okay. They're just trying to light their crack pipe, man. You know what I mean? Give them a break. You know, it's difficult to steer and talk on your phone and open a beer at the same time. You know what I mean? Just be cool, man. You know, show some love for Bubby or Sissy or whatever. Anyway, there is direct targeting and then there's indirect targeting. And the way they do it indirectly is through those means. You'll be, you'll have your hands full and you'll be coming up to a counter and there's no one else around and you want to check out whatever, you're in a closed store, whatever. And all of a sudden, here comes somebody just out of nowhere. You didn't even see them and here they come. Oh, I have a question. And then they sit there, stand there at the counter and talk to the, to the salesperson. And the salesperson doesn't care. Or you come to a counter, this happened to me a lot. It still happens to me some, but I mean every single time. I would go somewhere, uh, go to a counter, go for an appointment. It wasn't a minute, half a minute, minute that I was either at the counter or sit down to an appointment that their phone rang. Every time. And so they would spend time talking on the phone. They neglected... They neglect the fact that they have somebody sitting in front of them in person. They put more importance to the, to the conversation they're having on the phone. Okay. And then you've got people in line. And you've got somebody that's in, in front of you that takes forever to get their money out, takes forever to figure out what they're doing, and then they just chat and this and that. And there's a whole line of people behind them. Couldn't care less. These are the mechanisms uh, through which some might think that they're being directly targeted. In my experience, it's it's really an indirect sort of sort of a target. It because Satan's got his robots. He's got people who could care less. But see, you start with not caring about anybody else but yourself you're automatically going to cause havoc. You're going to cause trouble. You're going to cause problems for other people. We're in a store or we're doing something in our everyday life because we have to be there. We have to be in town. We have to be in the store. We have to be in the park playing with our kids. We have to be going to grandma's house. We have to be taking that trip. And it's just some people... They just continually are stopped for what seems like unreasonable, you know, purposes. It just doesn't make any sense. That's it. That's the indirect targeting. Um, There's a fellow I used to know. He's moved away. We were talking about that one day. We were saying, what is it with the traffic around here? And he says to me, he says, it's like they got their act together. It's like they all got it coordinated. They all showed up when they were supposed to. That's what it seems like. You'd be going down the road. Usually the way it starts is the way it lasts all day. You're going down the road, and 
somebody will pull out in front of you. I'm using the driving analogy again. Why couldn't they wait another five seconds to allow you to go past? They just pull right out in front of you and just do... It takes them forever to get to 30 miles an hour in a, another, you know, 55, 45 zone. Why did they do that? And then you come to a place in a row where you are, you know, the dotted the dash line, you can pass them. And as soon as you do, here comes somebody else doing the same thing. It's like, it's, it's, it seems like it's all coordinated. In reality, it's, the reason that it seems like it's everywhere is because it is everywhere. You've got many, many people dedicated to just being a doofus. They like it. Ever run to an elevator because you're late and there's somebody in the elevator, you see them, they see you and you're running and they just let the door close right in front of you? It's happened to me. You know, I tried being like that once when I was in Pittsburgh. I used to live in a, an apartment building just above where the Civic Arena is. And... I saw everybody doing it, and I'm like, how can this be? You talk about a dead place. I'm talking dead spiritually. Pittsburgh. At least it was in the late 80s. I don't know what it's like now, but for me, spiritually, goners. And I said, okay, I'm going to try to do that. I'm just going to try to be like everybody else and just be adult and just be nothing. See how I get along. Well, I wanted to throw up after a while. I, I couldn't do it more than just, you know, I couldn't do it. But it didn't make the situation any better. Everybody was doing it. And the reason is, it seems like it's everywhere. It's the reason like you seem like, it seems like you're targeted. You kind of are. It's an indiscriminate, you know, flat rate, you know, family pack targeting. I mean, we don't care who you are what it is, we see you with energy, we see that you got to do something, we see that you got to go somewhere, we're going to pour it on you, man, we're just going to be stupid. They like it. They like being that way. I uh, made some notes, forgive me, I'm going to turn away here, uh, because um, somebody, this has been kind of a subject here of late. Um, like, for example... Let's say somebody had a neighbor. Somebody. Just somebody. Had a neighbor. And this particular neighbor was kind of all right for a while. Yeah, they were different than the other neighbor. Somebody moved out and somebody bought, you know, the neighbor. You know, you've known that you were, you knew that neighbor for a long time and everything was fine. And then they move away. Danger. Because you don't know who's going to move in. And so... This somebody, winkity wink, uh, discovers that uh, this particular neighbor is starting to act up. Why? What has changed? Well, something might have changed. Uh, the death of a person. Uh, I think people. I think people's spirits. Uh, there are some people in this world that the grass just grows better wherever they live. Do you know what I mean? And when that person is gone. It's kind of like the hedge has been taken away. And the new neighbor decides that they're going to encroach upon, you know, their their neighbors, their, their neighbors. The new neighbor decides that he is just going to forget about boundaries and have a, you know, just have a difficulty with understanding, you know, where the lines are. So what you, what you got to do is you can't lay down. And this message is for... Uh, all you people uh, like me who have been targeted, because this is what I did in Pittsburgh. I didn't take it. I did it for a while, but then I started to be a little more assertive. There is a danger that when you become assertive that the other people who know the situation and they haven't told you yet, like they didn't tell me, it didn't come until, I don't know, a couple months or so before I left this place. And, like I said, I'll never 
say your name or identify you, but if for any chance that you're looking at me and remember me and know and remember who I am and you know that you're the person that told me, I want to thank you right here. I, I know I did then, but 25 years later, 23 years later, after, you know, after the fact, I haven't forgotten, okay? And, you know, your new neighbor just decides that he wants to just be a jerk. Well, there are ways around that. And I found my way. Oops, I just said it was me, didn't I? That's why the wink. Yeah, it was me. And now I'm talking about a neighbor. Uh, there is no mistake now that I will not tolerate any of that. And I did it without breaking any law and I did it without, you know, making myself, uh, you know, a further target. You know, I found a way to make it stop. So that's what you got to do. You got to be crafty in that way. You know, you know, these shows where they've got uh, a, a car with a couple of guys in it following somebody and the person being followed knows that they're being watched they, they go right up to the car and they say, by the way, fellas, I'm going to be in here maybe like a half an hour and then I'm going to go down to the quick mart and then I'm going to go do this and then I'm going to go home just so you guys don't get lost. You know, I believe that there are people in the employ of certain agencies that seem like regular neighbors. You know, they, they don't wear any shirts and they got a big pot belly and they go out and mow their yard and black socks and dress shoes and, you know, cut off jeans and that kind of thing. They, you know, they look like, you know, average American, the way Americans look now. And you wouldn't think that, you know, they could possibly be uh, somebody, uh, uh, an agent. Well, a lot of you out there know that those are the kind of people well suited for that kind of work. Um, and then you've got all the people that just look like normal everybody who just act like real morons. Because why? Because they haven't any natural love for people. They don't have any uh, empathy. They don't. It's gone in them. They don't have it. And there have, there's been a lot of talk about um, reptilian entities um, and so forth. Interdimensional beings. There are interdimensional beings. Uh, angels from heaven are interdimensional beings. If you, if that doesn't hurt your head too much, think about it. Uh, and likewise with demons. The way I've heard it said uh, is that they they can sometimes come into this dimension, but it's not good for them. It, it I don't know what it does to them, but it, it it's not good for them. So they can't stay here long. So what they what they've done is they they're like I've said in another video, they're making soldiers like the, the Nephilim, the demons that came and had relations with women here on earth. They're making soldiers through which they can accomplish their goals, see? And it's through the fear that they generate. It, it comes to, it feeds them. The fear feeds them. Um, there are many stories about people who get angry or they get excited or they get frightened or whatever and it'll throw the 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 you know the signal from their television off it'll throw it'll make the dials on gauges on measuring equipment electronic measuring equipment go crazy these are these are stories that are real they're true i i know somebody who told me the exact thing he's a he's a guy who used to work on uh nuclear stuff and he said it's true there he knows of, se of several instances like that and he's even produced such an atmosphere himself to cause his own equipment to go haywire it's true uh, you walk into a place and you can just feel something in the air there's a reason why you can feel it because it's there okay and it's the way with uh, uh, these entities these beings and uh, the people they control it's there. People get off on making you mad. They get off on making you sad. They get off on making you angry. And they get off on making you frightened. They do. It feeds them. And 
I'm going to look at my notes here again because I want to say a couple more things. i got to put on my glasses. Excuse me. Something I want to talk about with the Garden of Eden. Where's he going with this one, Charlie? I don't know. Let's just kick back and listen to it for a second. Okay, the Garden of Eden, where all this stuff started, right? You've got two trees in the middle of the Garden of Eden. One of the tree of knowledge and one of the tree of the... Of, uh, tree of life and the, and the knowledge of good and evil. So Adam and Eve were, you know, having a day, and Eve was around this uh, tree or whatever, or she was somewhere, and the serpent started talking to her. Okay, I'm going to tell you something that you've never heard before. I've never heard it. I've never heard it from any pastor. Nobody even wants to think about it. They just don't want to think about it. Okay, so. Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. That's where they that's where they were. That's where they were situated, and everything was just awesome, fine. Okay, nothing nothing wrong. A serpent starts speaking to Eve. Let's assume for a second that serpents never spoke before. Can we do that? What do you do when a snake starts talking to you? Do you freak? Is it a new experience for you? To be startled in such a way, I think it might have been. So the serpent says to her, did God say not to eat fruit from any tree in the garden? And Eve replied saying, well, we're not supposed to eat of the tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, or even touch it. I can't find anywhere in the word where it says not to touch it, but it does make sense in a physical sort of way because let's say that you touch it and it gets on your hands, whatever, and then you just inadvertently put your hand to your mouth. You don't want to do that. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> you don't want to do that. So you don't want to touch it so that you, you know, can avoid putting any of it in any way in your mouth. So... Of course, Satan lies to her and says, "Oh, well, if you eat, you know, if you eat it, you'll be just like God." Well, here's the part I want to talk to you about because it's never been discussed anywhere else that I can find. Satan asked, "Was there any fruit that you couldn't eat?" And Eve said, "We're not supposed to eat of the tree in the middle of the garden." She was not at that tree. Satan, in the, in, through the snake, I'm sure, was on like an outskirt. He was like, Adam and Eve weren't even together. They were like, that's what Satan does to you. He gets you apart from somebody. He gets you away from the crowd. He gets you while you're alone. And I don't think he was anywhere near it. A tree of the knowledge of good and evil. <clears throat> And that's what he does. He gets you off to yourself. Ask yourself a question. If somebody, if somebody was to ask you, let's say that you're in a park, and somebody comes up to you in the park and says, oh, by the way, I've got to go to this specific building. I've got to meet somebody. I've got to meet a client. Where is this building? And they say, oh, well, it's down the street. It's over there. It, it's in the middle of the square. That means you're not there. That means they're not there. It means you're not there. And Eve said, it's in the middle of the garden. They weren't at the tree. So here's what happened in Mikey's brain. Eve thought about it. She had it on her mind. And the, I don't know if this was the next time they were together. That day, later on, it doesn't matter. All that matters is if you did something or if you didn't do it. That's all that matters. <clears throat> they were at the tree, she and Adam. And knowing that what the snake said and having thought about it for a while, she took a bite of it. I'm here to tell you, if that's the only woman in the world given to me specifically by God, I would have freaked, man. There's no way I could have just stood there and said, oh, isn't this fabulous, chomp? No, 
There was stuff that happened that that's just not written. Has to, there has to be. Guys, you know what it's like when you see your, your girlfriend or your wife doing something that you know is not going to work. You know it. <coughs> Sorry, I don't know what in my throat. You freak, don't you? Yeah, you do. Uh, and women likewise with their boyfriends and husbands. I know it. It's, it's what we do as people. We see someone else that we love. We have empathy, okay? It's what we do. Adam, rather than saying, stop it, okay, you've eaten a fruit, I didn't give it to you, but you put it in your mouth anyway, i got to talk to God about this. We're not doing anything else until then. He could have done it, but he didn't. Without God, he made the decision to go ahead and eat the fruit because he saw with his eyes that she didn't fall down dead. God was talking about a spiritual death, which happened to them. And so, God, knowing what happened, you know, they were all, Adam and Eve said, oh my, what, you know, we know what we've done, we know we're naked now, blah, blah, blah. God comes and says, where are you? He knows where they were. He knew where they were. <clears throat> and so, he, he blames God, Adam blames God for giving him the woman. It was this woman you gave me. And Eve, having no one else to blame but the snake, blamed the snake. You know, the animal that, or animals that were slain as a sacrifice to give them clothing, you know those animals are in heaven, don't you? You do know that. Even the gnat that God had fly into one of those guys' mouth, some big blowhard king guy to choke him to death that gnat is in heaven i am absolutely convinced that every single animal every every animal or anybody who was sacrificed for somebody else every animal is in heaven all those animals are there's there's no way that we have such a god that those creatures would have just been forgotten about has to be anyway that's my thought on it so this is how this all starts. This is where it all started. Eve decides that what God told her wasn't true. She got in her mind a way to get, you know, Adam to go with her to the tree or whatever. <coughs> Adam, being the doofus he was, decided in his way that this truth was now a lie and a lie was the truth. That's where all this targeting stuff comes from. That's why people are so stupid. They they haven't any any way, or they've forgotten a way to just you know make themselves understand. They they've just given themselves away. They've given themselves away is what's happened. And that's who we're dealing with today. We're dealing with people who just couldn't care less about anybody else but themselves. Do some of them sign up to be these agents? Are some of them possessed? Yes, absolutely. And then you've got some that just are that way indiscriminately, just by being dumb and stupid. Uh, so I am with everybody out there who's been a target. I understand it in my own way. And there are others uh, with you too. So I wanted to give my perspective on it because there has been a lot of talk about it and incidentally enough I just happened to see through one of my subscriptions somebody talking about it and I was preparing myself to do this video and it just couldn't be any more timely so I want to say to everybody don't be a doofus don't be one of Satan's robots don't be one of these people that get out of my way I'm going to church you know you're out there and you're really you don't know what you're doing you, you you really are gone. You're out there, man. Snap out of it, okay? What is it going to take? How many, you know, Christ died for you once. Get with it. Get out of your church if you have to. Quit listening to your pastor telling you this, that, and the other thing if that's what it takes. You, you quit a church, are you going to go to hell? Hardly. You might save yourself by coming out of one or two of them. Definitely if you're Catholic, definitely if you're pagan or, or whoever you are. 
It's like I said in my very first video. You can come to the knowledge of Yeshua at the very last day of your life, just like one of the two people crucified with Christ on that day. He came to himself. He figured it out just like the prodigal son. You know, there he was feeding pigs, wasted all his money on fast living and whatever. And this guy on the cross, he knew that it was, you know, he, he figured it out. It, it, that's what, you're on that cross every day whether you know it or not because you're, you know, you will die. Some, we're all going to die. Once you've lived long enough, you're, you're going to understand, you know, you're, you're mortal. And if you haven't lived very long and you're one of these people that just go out rabble-rousing and just being an idiot, always getting into trouble, how come I get into trouble all the time? It's their fault. It's your fault. Just like the guy said on the cross. It, it, it was his fault. And he asked the one who didn't do any of the crimes, being crucified in the same way, to remember him when he went to his kingdom. Please don't forget me. I, I don't want to be lost. I, I, I want to be with you. That's the whole thing. And that's the only thing that's going to break you, you robots of Satan. That's the only way it's going to... You've been a, Satan, you've been a robot for a while. Maybe you're not lost yet. I don't know. Maybe you are. But if, you've got, if you're listening to this and it gets to you, or if you listen to somebody else saying sort of the same things I am, the people uh, who have been targeted and, and have come through it, there's courageous, courageous people. I applaud you. I understand. I know what it's like. I've been targeted in other ways. I just gave one example. But uh, we're saying this stuff so you understand it. And that if you're one of these people who who are the stalkers, part of the gang stalk crowd, whatever it is you are, and you think you're gone, you think this is the only thing you've got left, we've beaten you. You can join us, come out of it, and know who the Messiah is, or you can go straight to hell. And that's where I'm going to leave it. Everybody, keep yourself safe. Get some spite. Spite works. As long as you don't break the commandments, and you don't break any laws, spite's a good motivator. Spite will keep you alive. It kept me alive. It might keep you alive. At least up here. Okay? See ya.